Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 145, Not As Bad As They Look, Ugly Board Games That Play Great. I'm Sean, and with me as always, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, first off today, after the suggestion box, we've got the results of our Extra Life Gaming Weekend. That's followed by a question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons about games that didn't draw us in with their looks, but featured great gameplay. After that discussion, we've got a review of a couple of games, sorry, reviews of a couple of games from Good Game Publishing that obviously don't suffer from the problem of being ugly. They both look great. Uh, We've got the Alien B-Movie Dinosaur Western expansion for Unfair and Guildmaster. Finally, we do wrap up with a quick list of the games we played during our Extra Life Tabletop Appreciation Weekend. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a couple of comments on our topic of word-based party games from a few weeks back. Dead Accent writes, Decrypto and Japan. And oh, no, Japan oh, sorry, Newbie. Japan Newbie commented, Insider heard that one was good. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that, <laughs> Japan Newbie. Two different names. I get, I get how Sean misread what I put in the notes there. Uh, honestly, two games I've not had a chance to play myself. Uh, the Crypto, I have heard really good things about. Every time I talk about party games now, someone's like, Crypto, the Crypto, the Crypto. So it's on my list to try. You know I'm not a huge party game fan, though. So with the, with the pandemic going on, that's my main excuse for not having tried that. Surely someone local's got to have it, and I'll get to play it at a game store sometime. Now, as for Insider, I honestly have no idea what that game's about, so I don't know Insider at all. As usual, though, we will toss links to both of these games in the show notes. Uh, now, Decrypto might already be in the show notes because uh, of, of that episode, I thought, because I, I thought that might have been a... Uh, Honorable mention or um, something? Well, one of the... in the uh, I thought the, the fans or lobbyists mentioned that one. That's so, highly possible. I, I'll admit I did not go back to the episode to look. I just assumed if someone's like, hey, Decrypto, maybe they were saying, yes, it's in the list, mate, instead of uh, saying, add it to the list. Nonetheless, yeah, people dig it. Yep. Anchi Games says it sounds familiar, too. Yeah. Well, next, a comment from Courtney Jacks on our World's Fair 1893 Second Edition review. Does this one have a best player count? If so, what do you think that is? A good question, Courtney. Uh, The main mechanic in World's Fair is area majority. And any area majority game, I suggest playing with at least three players. Now, I personally prefer World's Fair at four, but would rather play with three than with two. Now, no, all that said, this game is solid at two, and it works at two, and Deanna and I have enjoyed it at two, But you asked what the best player count is. And for me, that's four, then three, and finally two. All right. Well, next, we've got a comment on your Zaya insert build. Mm -hmm. Steve Davey writes, Zaya is awesome. I just finished a wood organizer for mine, which is great, but took hours to build over several days. Congrats on the upgrade. And thanks for your channel. Great stuff. Happy to subscribe. Oh, welcome, Steve. I hope you enjoy uh, more of our content as time goes on. And thank you for this comment. My main reason for not going with a wooden insert here for Zaya, and actually, to be honest, I wanted an insert for Zaya, and that's what got me to reach out to Folded Space. Is I'm like, does Folded Space make a Zaya insert? Because I need a Zaya insert. Once I got all the Kickstarter stuff and the expansion, that game was a bit of a mess, which if you watch the unboxing, you got to see how I was storing it all. The thing is, it's a heavy game. Uh, the combination of all the miniatures that are in there, which are which are not, not heavy plastic, but dense, like they've got some weight to them. They're not metal. But then there's all the metal coins. And I even had the Kickstarter uh, 2000 credit coin. So I have a lot of metal coins. I really didn't want to add more weight to that box. And that's what I loved about the Fold Space insert is it was so light. And then the fact it was easy to build honestly was an added bonus. Now, I actually just posted up a full review of the folded space box insert over on the blog last night. So if you want to see more, like I had already released the video where I showed you build, building it and I give a few of my thoughts. Well, I actually wrote up some more, a form, more formal review on the blog. If you do want more info on that box insert. 
Well, we haven't heard from Chris Groff in a couple weeks. Chris commented on our Aroma review last week to say, good review, certainly not a game I'd ever want to have or play. <laughs> Just sounds like something you'd get as part of a swag bag from a convention. Okay. And Jay Barron's also commented on the same review to say, I would lose every time. I have severe sinusitis and can't smell much. Well, good to hear from you again, Chris. It had been a while. I, yeah, this one's definitely not going to appeal to everyone. I, I didn't expect it would. I, I know I was probably an outlier and even looking to check it out in the first place. Now, as for a swag bag, I could see it, but not at the MSRP they're charging, at least not at like an Origins or a Gen Con, but maybe at some kind of big fashion fairy grants con where people have enough money, they can throw them $70 gifts in a bag. Sure. Now, as for Jay, thanks for the comment. And honestly, as long as you can smell it all, that might be an advantage of not being able to smell much because those scents are strong. A weak sense of smell may have actually been an advantage, especially once we played for a while and everything kind of filled the room and mingled together. All right, well, finally, let's wrap up with our favorite comment of the week. Jen L. Car Charlton sent Mo a direct message to say, my husband says thank you to you. He got a huge haul of great games for his birthday, all because of recommendations I'd heard from your podcast. Oh, thanks so much for the comment, Jen. Um, I love hearing when our game suggestions actually pan out for people. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A couple of things we want to mention before we get on to answering this week's question. Now, I'm guessing some of you were expecting to show up here tonight and sit through a full episode of us talking about the games we played for Extra Life and how we did during Extra Life. And I do apologize that if you were looking forward to that, because we're not doing that today. Due to the fact we just spent most of last week talking about Sean Khan and the games we played then, we didn't really want to spend two weeks in a row just listing the games we've been playing. In addition to that, we also spent a large part of our Sunday brunch talking about all the games we played on the weekend. So what we'll do here is a short recap in the Bellhops Tabletop segment for those that couldn't join us for brunch. Now, what I want to do here right now in our announcement section is thank everyone who took part in any way. Thank you to those of you who watched our live stream. Thank you, Tori and Kat, for gaming with us in person and agreeing to be on that live stream. Thank you to those of us who gamed with us online through Tabletop Simulator, Board Game Arena, and Codenames.game. That includes Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, though Sean from Hamilton was there too. Uh, Danielle, too much coffee painting, an awesome local miniature painter. Our old friend, Huge, who joined us for most of the weekend. And Roger Dodger Gaming for at least trying to join us for a couple games of code names. And most importantly, thank you to every single one of you who donated to the cause. Over the weekend, our team managed to raise over $370 US for the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Thanks, everyone, for making Tabletop Appreciation Day a success. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that this is only one Extra Life event, and despite this event being over, donations are open for the rest of the year. Quick correction, I forgot to thank Kevin for playing Codenames with us. I forgot he joined in on Sunday. We were a little burnt out by that. No, you can still donate by hitting the donate button at windsorextralife.com. I look forward to our next big extra late gaming event, which is scheduled for the beginning of November. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from tabletop bellhop patron, Kevin Renault, who went over the website and clicked on ask the bellhop with this question. What are some games that didn't appeal to you by sight, but you were blown away when you played them? Well, thanks so much for the question, Kevin, and your continued support of the show. I thought this was a fun topic to talk about. The one thing I do have to start with, and this is true of all our topics, but I think more so than usual tonight, this is going to be 100, 1,000, 10,000% subjective. This is going to be mine and Sean's opinions on games that we thought weren't visibly appealing. And please, no hard feelings meant. We're not telling you your game is garbage or it looks like crap or it's a terrible game 
What we're actually trying to go is, hey, you know what? These didn't look as good as they could, but were great anyway. And like I said, realize this is definitely subjective. Yes, I realize most of our shows are subjective, but this is more subjective than usual, I would think. Yes, in many ways. I mean, games are an art form. And like any art form, people are going to have opinions about this. And just like any video game or movie or comic book or piece of art in a museum, some people are going to like it and some people aren't. The other important fact being that just because a board game doesn't have the most expensive art from the greatest artists mm -hmm. in the world doesn't mean it's not a good game. The game true. is separate in most cases from the art. Though I do have to say, I do like it when the two mesh together, as we will be talking about in our review section later tonight. Indeed. All right, we're going to jump right to the list. Um, also, you know what? We love interaction. So if you totally disagree with us, we want to hear that too, right? Uh, we don't tend to say the little line. We, we will share your content, positive or negative. It used to be something at the start of our show, but it still applies. If you do want to argue with us on any of these games, specifically, there's a couple on this list that get hotly debated online. I'm all up for it. So my first game of the night and the first one that came to mind when this question came up was Suburbia. So there's a little bit of a story behind this one that I think is worth sharing. So we're in Toronto on vacation. And in general, any trip Deanna and I go on alone, like the two of us, we hit up a game store, either on the way out of town or one of the first things we do, like the first night we're there, and pick up a two-player game to play in the hotel room. Something to unwind at the end of the night after doing whatever we're out of town to do. Now, on this particular trip, we hit up the newly renovated 401 Games, which used to be at 401 Young Street, now are not, but that's why they're called 401 Games. And we were blown away. Like the old 401 Games was one of those like really long stores with tons of magic cards and kind of had some games in the back. They like remodeled this into like a warehouse with shelving and shelves of games. Some of the most games I've ever seen in one place. I spent so long looking for games that Deanna got bored and left, and we let her meet, later met up at Amato Pizza, which Sean knows exactly where I'm talking about. Now, I get to Amato. I order my pizza from their 31 flavors or whatever the heck they have there. And Dee's like, well, what game did you buy? What'd you buy? What'd you buy? And I pull out Suburbia, and she's like, what the heck? Like, like with all the games in the store, the most games you've ever seen in one place, you bought the ugliest looking game. And I'm like, no, 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 trust me. Because at that time, I don't even know when this was, 2003, 2007. I don't remember when Superbia came out. At the time, I was into podcasts and I had been hearing fantastic things about this. Everyone, every podcast, like, you got to try Superbia. Oh, it's so good. That night, we try it out. And yes, it is so good. The thing is, not only is the cover of this game bland, everything about this game is bland. The tiles, the scoring board, even like you get an expansion that adds borders. They're just like, here's a solid blue border. Here's a solid gray border. It is one of the most boring looking games I, I have in my entire collection. But none of that matters when playing. The game is so good, you totally forget all of that bland art. Your uh, your time sense is uh, yeah. fallible as always, as Suburbia was released <laughs> in 2012. There you go. It was a so, little newer than I thought. A little a, a decade off, but uh, decade. the meaning still counts. It was only about five years from 2007. I don't know. Quarantine's messing with my previous year's knowledge anymore. Everything just feels like it was longer ago. Now, they did put out uh, Bezier Games, the publisher of Suburbia, did do a Kickstarter for a deluxe fancy edition that did improve the graphics a bit. Like, it's, it's a little bit more pop to it i will say it's still not great looking but what they did do is they added this like really awesome looking tower thing to hold the the hexes as they come out and i gotta say that looks pretty cool and supposedly the tiles are a little easier to read for what you need to know like the little airport symbols and the office tower symbols are bigger so i would appreciate that but still like the gameplay in this game's great sean's played it deanna's played it i am a huge fan of suburbia i'm grabbing the game to bring upstairs from my stack behind me i'm like man we gotta play suburbia again do you know uh, there's a there's a version that came out in March of this year? Uh, does that have any updated art, or is that just a, a re-release? What I understand, that's the like retail version of the deluxe Kickstarter, which I don't think it has the fancy tower and the game trays, but should have the updated art. And there was some rule tweaks to make things a little easier. Um, I can't remember. I read what they were, but it had something to do with the things like the airports, where like you get something for every airport everyone has, and an easier way to track that. Okay. 
Yeah, no, I, I have to say I love Suburbia, but literally the I, I played it at uh, a con with D one time for yeah. my first play, and I couldn't have told you the next day what any of the artwork <laughs> on the game was. Yeah, like it, it, it's just bland, and it's not like bland in that you know tool. It's bland but extremely functional kind of way. Yeah, like it, it's it's not just to make it clear to see what's going on in the game. Otherwise, like a bunch of blank tiles with just icons in the middle would probably work better. Yep. Well, that was suburbia now the next game that popped into my head right away was brass from martin wallace now the original version just called brass not the new brass lancashire version i love brass it is honestly one of the best games in my collection it is a fantastic game it's one i need to get sean to play it's it's a economic euro with train elements and route building and engine building and upgrading things and there's a tech tree like there's just so much going on in brass i have loved this game since i discovered it years ago and it wasn't right when it came out but not long after but it's always been hard to get to the table because it features one of the most drab and boring and tan boards you've ever seen. The thing is, similar to what I was just saying, like, you know, tool made it or something. It was very functional. It worked. It was very clear to see what the different icons were. And it was really easy to see which cities were connected to each other via canals or via roads. It worked. But man, was it ugly. Now, when Roxley Games announced they were going to reprint Brass and update it, I jumped right in. I went all in on this Kickstarter train, and it was totally worth it. The new printing of Brass, now called Brass Lancashire, looks a thousand times better than the original. Plus, it had the added bonus of some couple rule improvements, and then there were the iron clays that came with it, which puts that's still a step above every type of currency ever in any game ever. And then they even put out a new version of the game, which added new elements to it, like beer and having to feed beer to your workers in Brass Birmingham. Now, what I thought was funny about this, and I kind of feel like a board game hipster saying this, but like everyone was suddenly into brass and everyone loved it. And I was always sitting back there. I'm like, oh, I like brass before it was cool. But I am really happy to see more people discovering this fantastic Martin Wallace game. And that was Brass. Now, next up, we have Terraforming Mars. Now, while this game is one of our whole team's top favorite games and one we play physically, digitally, and pretty much make sure to throw down at any public Mm -hmm. play event, it is not a visually well-designed game. The card layouts are skewed. The images are mismatched across the entire game and lousy quality in many cases. It's a game that is quite easy to dismiss on a visual level Mm -hmm. as cheap and forgettable until you play it. Now, while it does have its haters, we stand by it as a great game, even if you need to ignore the art and even upgrade some of the components to really enjoy it. I totally agree with that. Um, A lot of the art in Terraforming Mars is stock art, and people hate it for that. I will admit, I I don't know what it was about this game, maybe because I enjoy heavier Euros. It never bothered me. It never bothered me at all. And I never even thought of it as drab. But again, I heard about the game ahead of time, and I heard the hype before playing it. And I was really looking forward to experiencing this card building, tableau building, little cubes to represent animals and building bacteria game like that just sounded so fascinating to me that all a bit I ignored most of the artwork and I didn't even think to put this on this list this was a totally Sean's call and I saw it and I'm like oh yeah like if not me enough other people have complained about this game yep and that was terraforming Mars speaking of games people like to complain about looking terrible on the internet the next one I have is castles of burgundy this is one you see all the time and what i find amusing about this one similar to brass is a deluxe edition was released except it didn't quite work i i the new edition of castles of burgundy did almost nothing to improve the graphics of this great steffenfeld game i swear someone just took the old graphics and upped the contrast bar a bit and that's it now i do have to say this is an abstract game so there isn't a lot you can do to make it look pretty but the color palette they chose is just like like it's druid colors it's like all earth earthy browns and more browns with some brown and a bit of light brown but then there's rivers so there's some blue and there's some gray and trees that are green but the green's even kind of greenish brown blue like it, it is just such a bland game there is nothing enticing at all 
about this game. Like looking at it, trying to sell someone on playing this game, unless they've heard of it or they know the name Stefan Feld, no one's going to want to play this game based on just the looks of it. Now, that said, this is considered by many the best Steffenfeld game and still manages to spell, sell despite that because it's also considered Steffenfeld's best two-player game. So fair enough, people love it, but man, what a bland game. Yeah, no, the Castles of Burgundy showed up on every discussion of ugly board games, usually first in the list. The first person to jump in and comment on a Reddit thread or a BGG mm -hmm. thread was bringing up Castles of Burgundy. Now, speaking of Stefan Feld, I also need to put Carpe Diem on this list. To me, this one's actually worse than Castles of Burgundy. While the colors may be bland, there's little in the graphic design of Castles of Burgundy that actually impacts the gameplay. It just looks bleh. Sure, some of the building tiles could be a little easier to tell apart, but that is nothing compared to the tiles in Carpe Diem, where with my eyes, I have a hard time telling the difference between a green field and a green building. And even worse, the border scoring graphics are smaller and even harder to tell apart. Every time I've taught someone to play this game, someone at the table has mistaken a brown field for a brown building or the other way around for the same thing with green buildings. Now, that said, this is one of my favorite felts. I enjoy Carpe Diem more than Castles of Burgundy. And I realize I'm an outlier for that. This is a tile drafting game with a really unique scoring system where the scoring grid changes every turn. And you kind of have to like, bid and plan ahead till like the end game even on your first move to try to figure out what you're going to score later but it all doesn't work if you can't tell the tiles apart yeah that was carpe diem now next up we've got go cuckoo mm -hmm. to most people who look at this game they're likely thrown black back to playing pickup sticks as a kid and while that might be a fond memory, it's not exactly something you're going to go seek out and pay modern game prices for in a mm. hobby store. Then you see something, someone playing it. Well, that's interesting. That seems neat. And then you play it. And as you deftly try to balance a stick 10 inches out from the container in an increasing web of wood balancing eggs, you're hooked. Oh, seriously. Like you look at this game, you're like, it's a kid's game. Why do I want to play that? And then you play it and you're like, I know I don't want to play this. No, go away, kids. We're playing this. This is, this is my game now. No, we do love Go Cuckoo. Now, another game you hear people complain about all the time, graphically at least, is Food Chain Magnet. Now, I will admit the art style in this never bothered me that much. The art on the cards doesn't bother me. It's going for an old school diner look. I have no problem with that. I, I dig the aesthetic they went with. And many people don't. So... Take that with a grain of salt. There are people out there that just hate the overall aesthetic of the game. But throwing that out, the board in this game is terrible. It looks like someone printed off a prototype that they made in their basement using like a, a paper cutter and like markers. Like they, they, they used a one inch grid and colored things in with pencil crayons. The thing is, though, it works. It works really well because it does that whole thing where it gets out of the way. Like you, you don't, you're not distracted by the fancy graphics. It's really easy to look down and go, well, someone has a tile on that. So they own it. And that's obviously a billboard. And that place is looking for pizza. It's very clear. So fair enough. I get that. I, there, there's no second guessing. Everything's clear, but it really could use a bit more flash. And then the biggest complaint people have about this is the price. This is a splatter game and splatter games fall into a category called heirloom games. They're, they're, they're games that are created for a small audience at small print runs at prices of that. They're not mass produced. They're not printing thousands of copies. Maybe they're printing 1,000 copies. And then when they sell out, maybe they'll print another 1,000. And to be honest, it kind of is made in someone's basement in a way. So I understand where people are coming from, especially at that price, you expect more. But then splattered games play so well for those people who enjoy heavier games. If you enjoy heavy games, you're, the, the joy I have playing Food Chain Magnet way more than makes up for the lousy art. Those still come on those those board tiles. Give me something like like I, I don't know. Color code the roads black. I don't know. Something, anything. See, I to me. Food Chain Magnet has gone with a very specific style that is very clean and minimalist, and they stuck with it for better or worse. And, you know, again, you get people hating it and you get mm -hmm. people loving it. But either way, that is Food Chain Magnet. 
Now, jumping to games I never hear anyone talk about is Hacienda. This is a game that never took off. You never see anyone talking about it. And I think the main reason for that is because the game doesn't look appealing at all. It looks like a boring Euro game with a bunch of hex tiles and different colors and chits with animals on them, all being placed on a map that looks like a desert with a dog bone in it. If you played the game, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't represent a real territory. It's all abstract to make sure everything's balanced. The thing is, this is a real hidden gem. This is actually one of my wife's favorite games. It's a really solid, especially for something that came out in 2005. Now, this is an old Rio Grande Euro, and you expect it to have a certain look, but even for an old Rio Grande Euro, this looks bad. I would love to see a deluxe, not, not even deluxe, just someone reprint it with some modern aesthetics. Yeah. So uh, 2019, second edition came out. Oh, uh, there you and, go. And, and it has been, I don't know, but improved but it is different. So uh, again, it, it's definitely more colorful. I don't know right. whether that's good or bad. I don't know the game well enough to say, but yes, uh, 2019 White Goblin Games published White Hacienda Second Edition. I've never even heard of that company. So I'd say at least someone else out there loves it. I'm, I'm happy just knowing that. Like this was a game that we discovered, we're going back to Toronto and on vacation at the Harry Tarantula, where we walked in there and someone behind the counter, we were, we, we were new to Euros at the time, like like still fairly new. Like I played Catan and I, I knew Aaliyah was a name to watch for. And at that point, I had collected all the big ones, right? I had Princes of Florence. I had Raw. I had all those big ones. And we went into the store and I told them, I'm like, I like these kinds of games. And the awesome person behind the counter was like, you want this, Hacienda. And I looked at it and went, really? Are you sure? <laughs> like, no, no, you want this. And we bought it. And it was one of them went back to the hotel room like, well, that was awesome. Great suggestion. So thumbs up to whoever that was working at Harry Tarantula that night. <laughs> and that was Hacienda. Now, next up, we've got Tyrants of the Underdark, which I finally <laughs> got to play just a couple of weeks ago. And this game is ugly. And on top of that, it's hard to distinguish things between the ugly and ugly with a lack of interesting and contrasting color. Now, the one redeeming design aspect of the entire game is the assassin figures, which stand out as apparently the only thing they actually had a budget to spend money on. The game, however, <sighs> is a D&D board game that evokes the ideas of its theme explicitly through its play, and unlike some other games, is so well integrated mm -hmm. that it's hard to imagine putting this specific set of mechanics anywhere else. True. Which is a shame, because it looks like someone vomited grape Kool-Aid and clay onto the board and cards. <laughs> All right, I'm not quite that rough on that game. My problem is it looks like Risk or something. It looks like a folk on a map game. And and like the little shields technically are all unique. Like they shields? actually do look different, but they those could have been, those could be cubes. <laughs> yeah, you didn't even know they were shields. There you go. They're little shields. Your units are shields. Your little drow are kind of awesome, which is fair. But like even the card art, like it's it's like kind of bland. Like you got it's D D. And that was Tyrants of the Underdark. So speaking of D&D, &D, right? Because this game has the same problem. The entire Dungeons and Dragons adventure series of games. I'm sorry. These are D&D &D games. The, the, the system created for dungeon crawling with, what are we up to? 40 years now? 45 years now? 40 years? It's got to be about, well, how old am I? So 47 years worth of artwork and awesome DD &D settings and and background information to use and here you get these plus shaped tiles that all interlock with each other with boring gray hallways with maybe a shield here or a lost sword there a bunch of unpainted miniatures and the boring most boring looking cards and tiles you ever see like, like literally like a card that's like black diagonal, it just says action on it and, and, and cards with no artwork at all. Even worse, the latest games in this series, the ones that are coming out now, the fifth edition is out, are ditching the minis and replacing them with counters. You still get miniatures for the heroes, but all the bad guys are replaced with counters. I just don't get it. It's Dungeons and Dragons. How are these cards not covered in awesome artwork? Like there's so much D&D &D artwork out there. With, with an entire line, like a D&D &D brand out there, how can they produce a tabletop game that doesn't look good? It, it baffles me. 
that that these bland tiles like i would love to have used the tiles in my dnd games but instead i have the official dnd tiles that look amazing why weren't those used for these board games like i just there was a left hand right hand problem i don't know what it was now i will admit these are not my favorite games i, I don't these aren't my favorite dungeon crawlers so really this is on the list not because the games are great but look terrible but just it's dnd how could it look so bad yeah, there's definitely some licensing departments that aren't talking to each other or haven't made agreements between artists. So you're they're not allowed to take, you know, book art and put it into a board game because that's a totally different contract or something. Yeah. But that is what you end up with with the D&D Adventure System games. I'm going to be killing myself for links later for just not picking a specific one. <laughs> All right. So one I didn't think of on this list till I started doing research, because as I said before, we actually do do research for the show. Anytime we do a list like this, I sit down, I come up with what's off the top of my head. Sean adds what he thinks of. Then I go digging to see what other people came up with. And either either sometimes I change the list, sometimes I don't. But sometimes I see something on a list. I'm like, oh, yeah. And that's this dominant species. The reason I didn't think of this one is I really love this game. This is a game I haven't played in too long. It's a big, heavy GMT game. It's it's like a six hour, right? People like to talk about Twilight Imperium being a long game. Dominant species can be as bad. I love this game. And this game is an action selection game where you're trying to actually evolve a species to survive in hostile environments before an ice age hits. And you get so invested with like the amount of heaviness just disappears because you're just invested in your species. And I tend to completely forget what the game looks like. So in a way, that's not bad, right? Like the, the graphics get out of the way. I don't even think about it. But then when you step back and look at this game and your entire species of primates that is spread around the world is represented by a tall cone and some cubes. And the board is just a bunch of hex tiles with little colored counters in the corners. I'm like, oh, wait, this doesn't look like a species populating a planet at all. It looks like a boring war game. Now, as I noted, the game works fine. But there is a reason why there are so many Etsy shops out there and meeple shops and places that will sell you upgrades to this game to make it look better. And that was Dominant Species, one of those games that ends up on everyone's ugly game list. Now, next up, I have Dominion. Because plain is really what you have to say about this game. Just utterly uninteresting. Mm -hmm. It was released at a time when we were already used to the glorious artwork of magic cards. Why would you play a game with a bunch of cards that were so plain and didn't feature magical worlds and creatures, but instead some coin or a shield and artwork dragged out of like the early, early first editions of Magic the Gathering before they had gotten enough uh, oomph to get the real artists in. Mm -hmm. But then... Uh, especially when it first emerged, you played it and found a new experience, an actual new experience, a new mm -hmm. style of game, a new mechanism. And while it hasn't held up completely in a world where deck builders are everywhere, this mm -hmm. game still provides a strong gameplay and a real important place in history, if not one on everyone's shelf, despite being out of date artistically, even when it first came out. The one thing I will say Dominion did right is it's easy to see what each card does. Like if you if mechanically, if, if you were playing it as a prototype and ignoring the art, which you tend to do because it's not very good, it works. The, the artwork definitely doesn't get in the way. And that was Dominion. Now, the next game I have was actually one, another one of the games that popped in my head right away, and that's Drop It which sadly I don't own. I have gotten to play it thanks to uh, Queen City Conquest. And it's one I, I've got to get this at some point. Now, while I wouldn't call this ugly, and this isn't an ugly game, but it definitely fits as a game that doesn't look like it's going to be all that interesting or fun. Kind of the same way Gokuku does. It looks like a toy sitting out on a table, but it's not until you drop your first couple of pieces and drop it and start scoring those pieces that you realize just how well designed this game is. Well, it may look like a kid's toy, there is a really solid game here. And there's a lot more um, dexterity and sort of careful thought that needs to go into dropping these pieces than you ever would expect. I remember mm -hmm. one of the first time I dropped a piece and it didn't behave the way I was expecting it to, which causes a sort of 
cascade of uh, results. Mm -hmm. And that was Drop It. Now, my last game for the night is a true classic, El Grande. Over the years, especially back in the early 2000s, the term cube pusher became popular, especially for Euro games. And that's due to a number of board games, mainly from Rio Grande games and Mayfair games that used cubes to represent pretty much everything. Uh, in this particular case, forces on a map. El Grande is one of the most well-known of those featuring two different sizes of cubes. You have your, your, your soldiers, and then you have your Grande, who's a, like the leader, the, um, the leader of your troops. And then you also have the most phallic game piece ever produced for the king. Now, what I will say about this is that it all is very functional. You can't miss that king. You are never not going to notice where the king is. You'll know exactly where he is for the entire game, unless someone's happening to be playing with him at the time, because that tends to happen. And the large grande cubes really do stick out when compared to the others. So to be honest, these components do make the game easier to play. But looking at this game nowadays, just seeing a bunch of cubes on a Mac with this black phallus in the middle of the table just seems lazy and boring. Like I keep expecting someone, anyone to do an update of this game possibly featuring minis like Academy games has even done this for their old cube pushers. They're they're the latest uh, 878 Vikings, right? 878. I think I got that right. 878 Vikings is all minis instead of cubes now. And I thought I'd hate it because I thought they'd fall over, but it does. It just looks so much cooler when looking at the board. I would love to see an updated El Grande because man, is that a bland board, like cube pusher. Like you look at it, you're like, Oh, that's a cube pusher. And that was El Grande. Now, my last one on this list is Draconis Invasion, which we've just reviewed. Now, this game is sort of a misdirect. Mm -hmm. The box, with its dragon attack on the front cover, does look intriguing. Yep. But then you get into the cards and layout of it and think, oh, it's Splendor with dragons and scary skulls. The artwork is dark, low contrast, and often indistinguishable from other cards at a distance. Mm -hmm. But then you play. And maybe the terror annoys you, but you play again because you think you might have a solution for something you noticed. Then you play again because you wonder if this one other strategy that you saw emerging might work. And then you're on your sixth play and you're really thinking, just one more game. Is yep. it a great game? No. Was it far more engaging than I had ever expected and kept me wanting more? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I was shocked by th this needs to, we had a list. What are the, like the most surprising games you didn't expect to love? That's this one's definitely on the top of that list. But yeah, the, the action cards in particular, they're just dark blues and grays. And then we looked at some specific cards and couldn't even figure out what the artwork was supposed to be. Like, I think they took some big images and cropped sections to create multiple well, cards. And they them. absolutely did. If you go to the BGG page for Draconis Invasion, they actually have uh, six or seven original art pieces. And yeah. they're large, like, like and they, high definition versions right. of art, which are then cropped down to a single like Instagram that style. That makes square. more sense. Now, you said Splendor. Did you mean Splendor or Dominion? Dominion. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't <laughs> think Splendor. Though, no. to be honest, a, a bunch of cards laid out in rows and columns does kind of look like Splendor. So Indeed. I wasn't sure. <laughs> that. Yep. Yep. Fair enough. And that was Draconis Invasion. Again, you can check out our review for that. It just went live last week. Well, that's it for our list of unattractive but great games. Let's head I over don't... to the lobby and see <laughs> if they have anything to add. Hello, lobbyists. What do you think of our list of bland looking games that are actually great? Are there any you know of that we missed? I gotta say, I was really impressed by the amount of interaction going on in our chat room tonight. There were comments on almost every game mentioned here. So I don't know if you want to scroll back up and fire through some of those. Yep. While you're look, scrolling back, I will mention a couple we did get from our Discord, a couple of our fans. Uh, what we do on our Discord, if you happen to be one of our Patreon patrons at any level, we have a private Discord. And what I do is I give everyone homework. So when I know where our topic's going to be, I'll ask in the chat room. Uh, and then I try not to look at it until we're, I'm actually doing the show notes because I don't want it to imp impact um, my thoughts first. And so I have Bike Guy Dave said, Imhotep is this way for me a bit. Board is pretty boring and a whole bunch of little cubes. Blech. Personally, I, I don't know. That one, Imhotep doesn't bother me, but I can see it. 
I, I, I just think I can think of worse. It, at least it's got the boats, like the little boats. Right? Yeah, help, there's there's little boats that. and the boats actually dock to the, the different boards. Yeah. And you stack the cubes look like monuments. I, I personally don't have a problem with him with that. Now, uh, Pax, uh, Dr. Donna says reflection comes to mind. It's kind of a cheap package, cheesy graphic design, but the game is really challenging and fun. This is one I don't know. So we're going to drop a link to in the show notes to this one. Uh, this looks like a, like a puzzle game more than a, a board game. So I was reflection. So uh, Ryan starts off going back all the way to the uh, suburbia top, right at the top of yep. our list. Uh, sounds like Ryan could sleeve the cards for adaptation if needs, but a play mat instead of a board could be tricky. Uh so I, I think I think suburbia as a for a blind meeple could be a really tough yeah. one. There's a lot to keep track of. And, Plus, and it, it is not cards. It's all hex tiles. Yeah, it's hex tiles. And the positioning of those hex tiles matters a lot. Yeah. A big part of the game is what's next to what in your board and your opponents. I, I think it'd be a real stretch, unfortunately, being able to play that one with vision. Now, if the if the uh, digital app version is accessible. That might be a possibility. I, I don't know if it is or not, but there is an app version of it out there. So that's worth checking out. Uh, D is pointing out that the new printing has improved the tiles. Um, and Oh, it uh, has like significant. I, th- I had heard complaints that they were still pretty bland. Well, it has improved them. I don't know if it's improved yeah, them much. Okay, fair uh, enough. And apparently it's, it's supposedly one of Tom Vassell's favorites. Uh, so we've got, uh, is good. It is. Like, it's a really good game. It's really good. It's I, just I, one of those games. You're like, oh, that's I, a good game. I haven't fired up the app in a while. And now I, now I want to, uh, I haven't <laughs> played my copy since putting a box insert in it. <laughs> uh, Razul's commenting on brass. Uh, yep. Never saw the original, both the new games. While the art is nice, it is very dark and kind of hard to see things. Uh, to be honest, yes, uh, but it's so much better than the original. I have a hard time complaining about the new verse. Well, we I did. I remember when we review when we reviewed it, trying yeah. to tell whether or not there was a, a train track there. That's I what I was going to say. My biggest problem is on the old map. It was more like you, you had a really dark line and then a blue one, and they wound different ways. Right. The new one has them next to each other, and it is very hard to tell if it's a road, a canal, or both. And it honestly is hard to see. Now, as for the dark board, make sure you're using the right side because they do have a light and a dark side of the boards and one is brighter than the other. Um, that's especially in the other edition because it's trying to go for that coal look and it's supposed to be dark to be thematic. And I agree, it's not a great design choice, but it's just so much better than the original that I, I have a hard time complaining about the new one. But yes, I get it. It, it could use a little bit of brightness. And Razul is commenting that his only issue with terraforming Mars was the player boards because of the lack of inlays. And that's a universal hatred for that game. Though, to be honest, when that game came out, inlays were not common at all. What I complained about is how flimsy they are. Like, I'll admit mine have held up. But when I got that game, I was worried they were going to get destroyed just from being into the box, out of the box. But for the amount of time I played it, honestly, good job stronghold games they've held up way better than i thought i had planned on laminating mine for a long time expecting him to get damaged right uh and uh a spirit of red move rising have burgundy to get a uh, tenth to get the, all the expansions in one box yes. not bothered yeah. by the euro aesthetic no totally fair and it is it's it's, it's definitely an aesthetic and I, I i don't mind it in some cases but in that particular one it's just it's blander than usual <laughs> And uh, Razul saying the original castles looks better than the deluxe. I, they attempted the upgrade, but made it worse. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like it's, now it's more in your face. It's not as bland. It's more eh. <laughs> I guess. Uh, Razul mentions he has the new Carpe Diem and literally lost because of the tiles being indistinguishable. Yes, they're, 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 you eventually learn that the one type have round edges and the other type has square, and that's more noticeable. But until you figure that out, like I, I, I'm shocked that got produced. That someone's playtesting somewhere didn't go. I have a hard time telling these apart. You might want to do something. They put a big star in the middle of one of the buildings. I don't even know. Like it seems like there were lots of easy ways, or just make them so that the green fields not the same green as the green building, and the and the brown fields not the same as the brown building. Which each do two different things. It would make even more sense if the green building was related to the green field, but they're not. It's just like they wanted to limit their like it's digital. It's not like you're going out and buying pigments. You know, yeah. it's not like the, like back in the day where you had four color comics because it was cheaper. Like you're all using Photoshop nowadays. Just <laughs> use more colors. Dang it. 
Uh, and then we get into our food chain magnet with the ridiculously expensive, super expensive, and looked like it was printed in a basement, with yes. the expansion costing even more than that. Yeah, I still haven't picked up the expansion, though. I've heard it's really good because of the cost. I, I don't have the disposable income I had when Food Chain Magnet came out. By the time the catch-up mechanic, which is a brilliant name for expansion about food, is amazing. But I, yes, I don't own the catch-up mechanic. Now, apparently D thinks that someone must love Hacienda because she found an app version of it. Yes, we have had the app version. Yep. Which you already pointed out, there's a new edition, which I'm going to have to look into that. That sounds cool. Uh, so apparently it looks pretty much the same based on what D okay. saying. So it hasn't changed all that much. Again, I don't know the game well enough to, to come. That's one of the ones we should show you, but it's one. Well, now maybe if it's republished, I'll make, it's one of those not really worth talking about because you can't get it. And no one cared. But now if it's available again, if I, if we can, if we can affiliate it, maybe we should try it out. Now, interestingly, Tech points out one game he would never have picked up with not for our suggestion was the Duke. Because the okay. board just looks so bland. And in oh, hindsight... It's a, it's a grid. Yeah, in it's hindsight, not even it's black very and white. True. Yeah. And the pieces aren't totally exactly true. much. They're just a little tiny little bit of icons on there. See, it, personally, I found the, the pieces intriguing. I was like, ooh, what's this? Like, right. like Because the, there's a lot of information on that little tile with lots of little symbols. Personally, I found that intriguing, but I can also see it being like, what the heck's this? What's going yeah. on? Uh, again, totally fair. And there are actually discussions I ran into today about chess, where apparently there are chess players who will more uh, more play with different pieces, more like they prefer certain pieces. And, oh, oh I don't want to play chess because of that board. No, I totally get that because my dad's chess set, the bishop looked like one of the pawns. Mm. It had a very similar shape, but there was a little cut at the top and it right. was a little bit taller. But like at a glance, I lost games because I mistook a pawn for a bishop or the other way around. Fair. Good to know. I, I, I'm not enough of a chess player to ever really think of it uh, in one way or another. Uh, apparently, oh, and sorry, Hacienda does come with a double-sided board and two variants in the new version. Okay, the original was a double-sided board as well. Okay. It, it was dependent on if you wanted it um, perfectly balanced, so there was a, the exact same amount of each terrain type around the dog bone, or it could be randomized. Uh, do, do, I guess we were talking about the Magic the Gathering when it came to uh yeah. to Dominion and uh, Magic the Gathering as a board game should not have failed as spectacularly yeah. as it did. That that's true. That the, the Magic yeah. board game was wasn't bad. It was kind of based on HeroScape, but they did a little bit more with it. And uh, the biggest problem was the core game. There was no deck customization. And I'm like, you can't put out a magic game without deck customization. That's the whole key concept of magic. And then eventually they put it in expansion with, again, a single deck. But you could at least mix and match. But by then, no one cared. And then they put out a third expansion that fully had, like, cards for all the other decks. But no one cared by that point. Right. Yeah, it was all too late. And that's talking about that particular, because there's another Heroes of Dominia or something magic game that came out that flopped so bad I know nothing about it. Uh, and Razul points out that King's Pawn, though, talking about El Grande, my wife's first comment was, if this thing vibrates, I'm out. I wasn't joking. I, yep. I wasn't trying. Uh, that wasn't meant to be hyperbole. Yep. No, there's uh, there are a number of fan models to replace that yes. particular king out there. And I'm sure some just enhanced that concept. <laughs> I'm sure there's and, both sides of that. Razul mentions Hansa Teutonica is plain beige board, but it's a Euro, so it's supposed to be. Uh, yeah, I, you know what? I saw that on people's lists and I thought about it, but I was kind of like, what else would you do? Right. Like, like, I guess you could theme it. So, so you're, what it is is your guilds and you're connecting trade routes. And you just, it's a board with a bunch of different guilds on it with trade routes with so many squares between them. And then you have a player board at the bottom that actually looks pretty cool with a bunch of like, it's even got like extra papers on the desk and stuff. So that part's fine. And the map looks good. It's a map of Germany with these these places that are in historic spots. And, and like, I guess you could switch the cubes for something else, but like you're building routes between guilds, like like wagons. I don't know. Like it, it's... It'd be like, I guess people probably complain about Ticket to Ride if they weren't trains and they were cubes. So I guess there's something you could probably put there. Yeah. But honestly, like to me, it's not that egregious compared to the other games we mentioned tonight. Like it kind of looks how I expect it to look. And to be honest, though, El Grande kind of looks like I expect it to look. It's just I can't believe no one's updated that game yet. I think that's my biggest complaint with El Grande and Wealth the King. 
and to be the king. The one game that uh, the one sort one set of games that I saw coming up on a number of lists uh, that I prefer not to support. Uh, but the PAX games look horrible. And again, again, the, yeah, however, the, uh, the, the author of those has is problematic enough that we probably shouldn't go into them. In, and I didn't want to put them into the main list as a result. But yeah, ugly games that some people love the game, love the game. Yeah, they're, they're, they're up there with the splatter games. Again, they're heirloom games, small print run games. Uh, some of them look neat, but yeah, we don't we don't need to talk more about his games. Nope. Uh, I think we're probably good. So, so Ryan's asking a quick question. Any way to make Kingdom Builder more exciting visually? It is bland. I don't. I found the whole gameplay of Kingdom Builder bland. It's not on this list because I didn't find the game great. Not only was it bland looking, it was bland playing. Um, I, I again, I don't know how you improve it, right? So you have a bunch of terrain out, and it's hexes, and they're different colors. Throughout. Well, they even have, like, they're not just colors, but, like, the trees have trees in them and whatever, and you're putting out settlements, and you're trying to fulfill patterns, whether that's rows or area control or pluses or whatever, and, and like, you are building houses. Like, that's the point. Like, that's why you're building kingdoms. Like, I'm not sure how you'd improve it without ruining the functionality. Because, like, you could do the thing that they do in clans of Caledonia actually does a good job of this where stuff overlaps into the, the, the other hexes. But to be honest, it's got a really good rule in that game where if you can see even one little tree in there, it counts as a forest. You'd have to do something like that. And you can't do that in kingdom builder. It's gotta be clearly distinct, but like, that's the only way I can think of to make it look a little better is make it look rough. But then you get the arguments that old war gamers used to always have that, well, is half of the tile showing trees? Does it count as difficult terrain? Or if it's less than a third, then does it count? And you get into these arguments over what a tile actually represents. And I think in that case, King to Builders abstract. Keep it abstract. Fair. All right. All right. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. Hello and welcome to a look at the Alien B-Movie Dinosaur Western expansion for Unfair. Thank you to Good Games Publishing for sending us a copy of this expansion to check out. The Unfair expansion, Alien B-Movie Dinosaur Western, was designed by Joel Finch. Features artwork from Nicole Castles, Lena Cassette, Dave Forrest, Naomi Robinson, and Yoma. It was published in 2019 by Good Games Publishing. Note you do require a copy of Unfair to use this expansion, which plays two to five players with games taking one to two hours, possibly more for your first couple games, depending mainly on the player count. This expansion has an MSRP of $34.99 US dollars. This was the first of a series of expansions that, from the looks of it, plans to cover the entire alphabet with decks. Yeah, I hope the game has enough staying power to get to Z. Now, the um, to shorten it, ABDW expansion for Unfair features four new theme decks for Unfair that can be freely combined with the decks in the base game, as well as any future decks that Good Game Publishing releases. This expansion also includes a number of new Game Changer cards, as well as an upgrade pack of replacement cards that do correct some balance and printing issues. So for a look at what you get in the box of this Unfair expansion, check out the Unfair Alien B-Movie Dinosaur Western Expansion unboxing video on YouTube. Are we going to get sick of saying that by the end of the uh, review? We'll see. Now, basically, what you get is a long, thin box with a skinny but thick rule book and a five-slot card tray that contains four made card decks, two smaller upgrade decks, and a bunch of cardboard counters that come pre-punched. Now, the rules are fantastic, with a section for each of the new theme decks, a reference for the game changers, an FAQ covering this expansion, as well as questions that have come up in the base game, and even includes a full summary of play for those who haven't played their original copy of Unfair in a long time and need a reminder of how to play overall. Now, the tokens are pre-punched. They're really thick. Uh, Good Games Publishing, all their tokens are always really nice and thick. Uh, these include new randomizers, alien influence tokens, a UFO standee, a dinosaur standee, as well as two hex tiles that are added to the board when using some of the decks here. Honestly, I have no complaints about any of the components here whatsoever. 
So we've got four new theme decks, some new game changers. How about you go over each of those and let us know what we're getting in this box and what it is they add to the core game. Sounds good to me. So let's start with an overview of the four theme decks. First up, you've got the Alien deck. Now this adds a new resource to the game, Alien Influence. A number of attractions, events, and upgrades provide players with ways to generate Alien Influence each round during the guest step. Now, the main use for this is to be able to purchase these high star value advanced technology attractions and upgrades. Now, these new cards can only be purchased with Alien Influence and not purchased with coins, nor are you allowed to build them for free because of the result of another card. Now, in addition to this, there's also a system for Alien Abduction, which adds a new phase to the end of each round. During this phase, any park employees that have been influenced by aliens are removed from play, but shuffled back into the deck. Note, shuffled back in, not discarded. Now, if it weren't for the alien influence, this could sort of easily be any other theme. But mm -hmm. with that alien influence, this is a whole new ball game when you add this deck in. And one of the most fun we had with this particular deck is looking at exactly what's going on with this alien influence. It doesn't seem like the aliens are all that friendly. Next up, we have the B-Movie theme deck. This deck includes a mashup of other themes and rewards players for having multiple themes on the same attraction. There's also a new attraction type called the Shop. Now, the biggest thing added to the B-Movie theme deck is something called Panorama Scoring. Along with this is a new option to pay extra coins to skip a space when building attractions so to try to complete those panoramas. Now, many attractions in the game are part of panoramas, and when built in the right order, and when panorama scoring is active, which right now is only with this deck, but possibly future decks will also have panorama scoring, you're going to get endgame victory points for any panoramas that have at least two cards in it, and bonus points added for having a complete panorama. Now, along with this, to make this, again, a little easier to do, is a new attraction type called the billboard. These are basically placeholder attractions that do generate a little bit of fame, but can be replaced by any other attraction in your hand during the event step. Again, perfect for saving a spot for that one piece you need for your panorama. It's interesting how little thematically this deck brings in terms mm -hmm. of gameplay, but what a huge deal the panorama aspect can become. Now, next up, we have the dinosaur theme deck, which, of course, is very much based on a popular uh, TV movie series and I guess TV series now as well. Uh, this is a high risk, high reward deck. Interestingly, the dinosaurs themselves are mostly upgrades that you add to your existing attractions. You can never have more than one dinosaur at a specific attraction. If you do end up with this, how oh, that happens in a second, the largest star power dinosaur stays and the lowest one is discarded, which we always assume represented the one eating the other, just taking out the other dinosaur in some way. Now, when using this deck, there is a new step added to the game again, similar to the alien deck, but this one's at the beginning of the round and is called the dinosaur rampage step. So you can kind of get an idea what's going to happen. During this step, you have to roll dice for every dino you have in your park. If you roll high enough, nothing happens. But if you get unlucky and roll low, the dinosaurs rampage. Now, what this means depends on the actual dinosaur with the little ones not mattering nearly as much as the big ones like the T-Rex. And it usually involves them closing one or more attractions and moving around the park, which can then cause you to lose other dinos as noted earlier. Now, some dinos will even move towards the gate and if they get there, they escape from your park. Now, the other thing the dinosaur theme deck does, which is a totally new thing, is they don't have any super interactions. Instead, there are two replacement park entrances. Now, these are shuffled with the super attractions and randomized at the start of the game, but they don't require you to have five stars in your park before you build them. And while they're gates, they play them on top of your original gate. And what they do is they completely change your amount of guests and they add extra bonuses to your roles and do very dinosaur themed things. Definitely add it in for those folks who aren't afraid to push their luck, even with all the take of that elements already mm -hmm. in the game. This deck is not for the faint of heart. Now that leaves the Western theme back deck. Uh, this is well-rounded, easy to use deck. Um, there is a new card type called the development. This goes to the left of your park with your employees. Um, the developments in this deck, what they do is they make your park bigger. They allow you to have more guests 
and more attractions, and even the ability to build two super attractions in one park. The Western deck itself and the Western theme cards are all about quality upgrades, and this deck introduces a new type of quality upgrade, which is always appreciated, and the theme cards let you build quality upgrades for free. So there's a big thing on medals and upgrades in the Western deck. Now, the final unique aspect of the deck is that all of the Western Panorama cards are set in a desert backdrop and can be played in any order. They can swap around any way you want. This means you can easily build a large panorama, but there's never a way to complete it. The downfall of this is that only actually matters if you combo this deck with the B-Movie deck. And as we mentioned previously, this deck was added to the recommended starting deck list since its introduction, so it's a great deck for anyone to begin with. Yeah, I'll get to my final thoughts later, but honestly, I wouldn't mind having the Western deck every time I play. Now, in addition to the four new theme decks, you do get a number of game changer cards in this expansion. Uh, these include cards like One for the Pot, which adds an additional theme to the deck and is especially recommended if you're playing two players. So you get three themes in there, even with two players. Uh, Prescience, which I think is a great sounding card that lets you see the upcoming cards in the city deck. And then there's Lunch Special, which makes things for a shorter game and more. So, all right, now that we know what we're getting, how about you share some thoughts on what you thought of this expansion? Is it worth picking up? So this type of expansion, this, this unfair expansion, gives me everything I want from a board game expansion. It adds to the existing game without changing it. It doesn't make it feel like a new game. It doesn't make it more complicated. It doesn't really add any weight to it. It just gives me more of what I love adding more replayability and more gameplay options to one of what was already my favorite games. Uh, the fact that they're evolving, shaping that game, and not just adding more bits, really shows a strong commitment to what this game is and the flexibility it provides. Now, the new Game Changers are a big welcome addition to me, to be honest. I really appreciate that there's something here to make the game shorter, and something else that can be added to mitigate some of the nastiest of the game without eliminating it, that prescience card. So what the prescience game changer does is you can see what's going to happen. So you know the bad things are coming, but you know what they are. So you can actually plan ahead of time and take actions to mitigate any possible losses. And then there's another one that I think is fascinating. This is the Jin's Bargain or Genie's Bargain, however you want to try to pronounce it, where each individual player decides at the beginning of the game if they want to take part in the city events. And it's an all-in, all-out kind of choice. If you don't take part in the city events, you won't have to deal with the unfair cards at the end of the game, but you also won't get the benefits of the fun fair cards. And what I dig the most about this one is this is an individual choice. Not everyone at the table has to go one way or the other. Some players could play with them in and some could players could play with them out. I really dig that game changer. So I'm both excited and worried about how the expansions are rolling out, as it's going to be hard to choose what content to play with at this rate. Well, they do give you the randomizer tokens that are specifically in there for those of you who can't make up your mind. Now, as for the new decks, uh, honestly, they're all welcome additions to the game. Um, of the four decks, I like Western the most. Very balanced deck. It doesn't really have any new rules to learn. Combos really well with other decks and honestly makes the panorama system simpler if you are using it. I do recommend if you try B-Movie for the first time, try it with Western involved too. I honestly, as I said before, wouldn't complain if every game I played had the Western deck in it. And I got to say, as Sean mentioned, the designers agree. This is now listed as one of the recommended starting decks for new players. So if you're teaching someone the game for the first time, the Western deck is one of the ones they recommend you use. That being said, it's tame, which is, I think, what you like about it to some degree. So if you're looking to ramp up that take that backstabbing and risk, you can leave this deck in the box. There is still some take that in there, the Gunslinger being the most obvious, which is a card that can take out any other employee in any other park. So it's not that it's completely free of nastiness. And the events, as usual, do have a top and a bottom. So they're just as nasty as any other deck. Now, my next choice uh, in order would be the Alien deck. I really like the Alien influence system. 
and the high value rides and upgrades you get with it. Like there are rides that have three or an upgrade that has three quality upgrade or three feature upgrades just for one card. Like you can really ramp up the value of your park with these. Plus we love telling stories about how the aliens are integrating into our parks. One of the basic cards that gives you alien influence is called the alien observation tower, which is basically a spot you put on one of your rides where the aliens watch people in your park. And we like to joke about how, you know, they're up in the rafters in the movie theater or you know they're sitting at the bottom of the water park getting splashed all the time and they're in like all wetsuits but it's actually aliens watching um plus one thing i actually enjoy in the alien deck is there's always someone at the table every time we've used this to tries to shoot the moon and try for an either no alien stuff whatever build which is uh, one of the blueprints in the game or the all alien tech blueprint that is worth 99 points before the bonus though i've yet to see anyone pull that one off this deck is a great option that blends risks and dangles big rewards, but also has a good mechanic that can work its way or perhaps invade into everything else. As for the dinosaur deck, I don't love it, but I know people who do. Um, it, it does exactly what you expect to do. It's a high risk deck that can get you a ton of stars early. You can build your first attraction in this park as a T-Rex and build your super ride all in turn one with this deck trust me i did it but there's always a chance your dinosaurs will rampage the t-rex closes every attraction in your park when it rampages while there are some cards to mitigate this there are two events that go in the event deck um you can eventually get gates but they are the type of um upgrade that players can easily destroy through events I, I, the, you can never completely remove the risk for me it just wasn't worth it like I was killing in this game because of my T-Rex and building a super attraction late the first turn. But then I had three turns in a row where my T-Rex rampage and I got nothing because I didn't have a single open thing in my park. It just, I don't think I'll be building a lot of dinosaurs when I play, but I can totally see other players loving this push your luck element. I, I know players that would be all in on the dinosaurs trying to see if they can have a dino on every ride and see how long they can maintain it. I fully expect there are people out there that the dinosaur theme deck made the game for them. Like it is now their favorite deck. They're always going to use kind of like Western is for me. Indeed. This is the one for those adrenaline junkies who want to push that risk reward to 11 or test their ideas about risk risk management with a real wild ride. Yeah. Now this leaves me with the B movie deck. Um, I don't know. After repeated plays, I just found it to be kind of boring. While I do dig the the theme cards, like I, I love the, hey, play, get something for every theme on a thing. And I love the shop. And like, if I can guarantee that if B-Movie's in, I get to build the shop, I'll be happy to have it in. The problem is if I'm playing with four other players, there's a good chance one of them is going to get to build the shop before me. Uh, the rest of the deck's just okay. I, I don't know. It just didn't thrill me in any way. And to be honest, I actually found the panoramas disappointing. They're just a, too difficult to complete. The first time I played with them, I was like, oh, man, these seem hard. But then the second game, we actually did some research and we actually did the time or sorry, a third time, third time using the deck. We actually um, went on our phones and looked up the deck build and looked up each possible panorama. And it ends up there in the back of the instruction booklet. I actually remember 25 page instruction booklet that comes with this expansion. It shows you all the panoramas, which probably would have saved us a bit of time. But anyway. What I noticed is for every single one of the six core game decks, the ones that come in the base game, to complete the panoramas, each one only has one panorama, you need a specific super attraction. Now, since these are randomly divided out at the start of the game, and you can only build one, your ability to complete a specific panorama is pure randomness. There, there's no skill or, or involved at all in being able to build one of those panoramas. Added to this, every single panorama, including the four new ones in this deck, well, there's one for it, one of the things actually has two different ones, take at least one unique card, with some needing as many as three unique cards. Like that is just a ton of fishing and hoping someone else doesn't build it and hoping someone doesn't notice that you're missing while even broadcasting it, right? Like if I have this piece and this piece and I build a billboard in the middle, someone knows I'm looking for that card now. I just, I don't know. Like I will admit the panorama scoring can lead to huge points. So they shouldn't be easy. So I understand why they're hard, so hard to build, but overall, I found trying to complete them was more frustrating than fun. This one, I feel, is the odd one out. 
While the panoramas are great, it seems a weak justification for the deck. You'll notice that in this whole discussion, we didn't talk about theme. There's no, like, no. it's B-movie. There's no, there's, there's no fancy dinosaurs or, or crazy aliens or Western shootouts. It's generic. Yes. Uh, but perhaps that's the point. If you want to score per, uh, the panoramas, you've got something there. But for me, this deck is a, when you've got a high player count, throw it in for that scoring option of panoramas, but you don't have to worry about messing up anything else with theme. Yeah. Like I said, the, the theme in this, now what I do think this deck is, I probably should have checked, is the one uh, question mark theme card, which can be hugely powerful, which is, which is a, a ride where you can change what theme it is. Where if that does exist in this deck, that's another thing that's added to it. But just overall, it's meh. And like I said, the panorama scoring, I... I I tried, and and then the one game we played, three of four players tried, and it just didn't work. So I don't know. It's okay. I, like again, none of these decks are terrible, but there's just those of them in my order of preference. I am kind of hoping that another deck in the future also turns on panorama scoring. Now, my only real complaint about this expansion, which is nothing at all to do with gameplay, is that while you can get everything into the base game box. It is a very tight fit and you kind of have to do it just right. Now this is made way worse if you have to sleeve your cards. Enough people have had a problem with this that Good Games Publishing actually has a page on their webpage to show you how to do this properly. And honestly, the way you do it with sleeve cards is shoving a bunch of counters underneath the box insert, which to me isn't really a solution. Yeah, and it's, no, it's still not the greatest solution we've discovered. However, there is a solution coming in the next expansion, apparently, though it's really frustrating to have to get another expansion to be able to properly hold what you already have. See, that that's such a hard thing for designers to, to or publishers to get right. Like, you don't want to sell me a game like something we reviewed last week with a ton of error in it where you're like, what the heck, what am I paying for? Plus, you also don't know how successful your game's going to be. While they may be planning to do expansions A to Z, do they release a box that can fit A to Z with no actual indication they're going to get that far? Like, it's a tough thing. I honestly think the big box method that most publishers are going with really isn't a bad thing. That, like, by the time you're getting to your third expansion, you're like, okay, well, now we're going to do this. Like, people are bought into our game. People like it. Now let's put out a big box. It'll fit everything. Everyone knows why we're putting it out. There's no confusion. There's no one going, why is all this air? Or you just sell the box separately, which some companies have done very successfully. Fair enough. Overall, I think it's pretty obvious. I was pretty impressed by everything this expansion adds to Unfair. I, I enjoyed every single one of the new decks. Yes, even the B-movie, just one of my least favorites. I did enjoy some more than others, which I think is fair. I think everyone's going to have that. Each deck's unique. It does its own thing. And all of them integrate with each other in the existing decks well. And I got to say, I dig the additional game changers. That was something I didn't even know was going to be in this expansion when I started checking it out. If you've got a copy of Unfair and you enjoy it at all, if you're like, oh, I like Unfair, I play it now and then, go pick this up. This is one of those expansions that just everyone who enjoys the base game should pick up the expansion. Now, I wouldn't say this is a must-have. To me, a must-have expansion is something that fixes the base game, where the base game's okay, and this makes it amazing. That isn't this. This just, it doesn't fix anything, because what well, doesn't need fixing. This is more of a, why wouldn't you get this? It's more options, more ways to adjust the game, more combos. Everything here just gives you more to love and unfair. And if you dig that, why not add more to it? Well, that's it for our look at the ABDW expansion for Unfair. When you've got time, be sure to check out the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com for a more detailed look and lots of pictures of this expansion. Welcome to a detailed look at Guildmaster from Good Games Publishing, a programmed movement-based fantasy-themed board game where players take control of competing adventuring guilds. Thank you, Good Games Publishing, for sending us a review copy of this game to check out. No other compensation was provided. 
Guildmaster was designed by Chris Anthony and features artwork from Andrew Bosley, Alexander Mihalovic, and Yamadou Danielle Orchi. It plays two to four players in under two hours on average. It was published in 2020 by Good Games Publishing. This game has an MSRP of $49.99 US. Now, in Guildmaster, players manage a fantasy adventuring guild competing with other guilds to become the most famous in the land. They do this by improving their guild hall, hiring adventurers, and completing contracts with those adventurers. Things get interesting when two or more guilds compete, driving up the cost of building, bidding for adventurers, or trying to complete the same contracts at the same time. In some cases, your guilds will agree to work together, but watch out for that inevitable betrayal. Check out what you'll get in the box for this fantasy game in our Guildmaster unboxing video on YouTube. So Guildmaster features a surprisingly thick, but very concise and detailed rule book with a ton of examples. I would say that 40% of this book is dedicated to examples and artwork of how the game is played. There's also a standalone quick start guide that walks you through the first few turns of a four player game to make sure you've got the concepts down. Now, along with the rules, you get a main board, thinner individual player boards and guild upgrade boards, four great looking player screens with full rule summaries on them, dice in three different colors, a number of thick pre-cut counters and three decks of cards spelled split over action cards, adventurer cards and contracts. Also, the adventure and contracts are at different levels. Now, my only complaint about any of this is the fact the box insert is your standard cardboard trough with one cardboard piece you can add that splits it in two. While there are some baggies included, the big complaint I have about this insert is this is not a good insert for a game with this many cards in it. The cards shift everywhere. Yes, you can put them into baggies, which helps, but it would have been nice to have like, like that divider should have went in a spot where the cards would have stood up nice. Yeah, this seems to be uh, an either or part of our reviews of late. They've either nailed the insert and we love it, or mm -hmm. it's just not properly functioning and frustrating. Well, now that we have an idea of what you get in Guildmaster, how about you give us an overview of how to play? All right. This one's a little bit of a longer one. So we're going to start with setup. Setup in Guildmaster is quite involved and takes some time. You're going to put the board out on the table, place the round marker, the building cost marker, and a fame marker for each player on the board in the right spots, as well as face down adventurers of all three levels. The three decks of contract cards are shuffled and placed beside the board, along with all of the upgrade tokens, the dice, and a bank of coins. Each player is going to pick a guild they want to play, takes the guild board, the guild upgrade board, and the screen in that color. They also take a full set of action cards, the appropriate ribbon, and a contest token. Everyone each grabs seven gold and puts it on the vault in their player board. Now, starting teams are determined. Now, these are not teams of players. These are teams of adventurers, and players take the appropriate skill upgrade token for that team and the set of novice adventurers for the team. Now, each skill upgrade token has two sides. Players are going to pick which one to use. One of them is going to let you re-roll a die, where the other lets you set a die to a five. The two starting contracts, which are the same every game, are placed on the board. Then everyone has dealt three common contracts. They're going to pick two of those to keep as private contracts, and then pay, place the last one face down on the board, filling the contract area of the board. Finally, all the face down cards on the board are flipped up. So for the adventure decks, you're just flipping the top card. For the contracts, you're flipping them all over. Note, with less than four players, there are some setup changes where some of the spots on the board won't be used and some cards are removed from the game. Now, while I didn't love the digital implementation of this game, it certainly saved a lot of hassle in the setup. Yeah. There's a lot of tokens to be sorted and stacked. It, it can be a little annoying, I will admit. This is one of those times where I tell the game owner to have the game set up when the other players show up, just to speed up getting the game to the table. Or play multiple rounds in a row, you don't have to deal with. Now, a game of Guildmaster normally lasts nine rounds. There is an option to play a shorter six round game. At the start of the round, you're gonna read off any events on the face up contracts. On rounds three, six, and nine, players will also get to draw a new private contract. Next, you get to the plot phase. Players are going to use plot abilities on their adventurers and then tell everyone how much money they have for the next phase. 
It's not too many games where you announce how much cash you have on hand. One thing that really defines this game is sort of the mixture of perfect and imperfect information mm -hmm. along with that hidden action selection to add uh, intrigue and confusion into yes. open knowledge. Yeah, the fact you get to know just how much money people has indicates how important knowing how much money everyone has is in this game. Because then we get to the order phase. This is your programmed movement part of the game. This is done in secret from the other players using your screen so no one else can see what you're doing. You're going to play order cards and adventure cards from your hand along with potentially some money and place them on your guild board behind your screen. Now, the guild board has four action spots on it, number one to four. At the start of the game, you're only going to be able to use the first two slots and you're only going to get to assign two adventurers at each slot. Now, both of these numbers can be upgraded with guild hall upgrades, which I'll talk about later. Any gold needed for the action also has to be dedicated now with the heroes on the spot you want to use them on. Money in your vault can't be spent once you're actually resolving these actions. Now, you use the action cards to indicate which of the actions you're going to take place, as well as like if you're recruiting a hero, which specific hero, or if you're going on a conquest with, or sorry, going for a contract, which specific contract. You're going to layer that with the heroes and the money you need. Now, because of earlier steps, players will know what you can choose, but of course, won't know what you are choosing yes. until the reveal. Now, many of the actions you're going to be taking require skill checks. So I want to take a moment to explain what a skill check is, because it's going to matter for the rest of the game. These are basically done by taking your characters, your, your adventurers, and lining them up. And they have six different skills on them. And you're going to total up the number values for all your characters assigned to the task for that specific skill and roll that many six-sided dice and add them up together with a max of 10 per die roll. So for the record, while not an aspect of the physical game, this rolling is oddly the part of the digital yeah. version just failed at. Yeah, I honestly keep wondering if we were doing something wrong on the digital implementation because it would put the dice up for a short amount of time and they go away and you couldn't even spend enough time to total them. All right, so the actions are, here's your possible things you're going to send your adventurers out to do. You can build. You're going to spend gold to hire builders to improve your guild hall. Every builder bought, increases the cost. So your first builder might cost three, your second might cost three, but your fourth might cost four. You, in this particular case, if you've spent extra money, if you put more money than you need on the action spot, you do get to take the, the change. You get to put that back in your vault. No, you do have to assign someone to hire them. So you will have to assign an adventurer. Now, the various guild upgrades, I'm not going to get into full details here, but they include skill upgrades that give you rerolls. There's guild upgrades that give you more actions. There's another one that allows you to send more adventurers. There's also a way to upgrade your pub, which generates you more money. Finally, there are prestige upgrades that feature end game scoring opportunities. Now, things get interesting if two guilds both attempt to hire builders at once. A skill check is made. Again, your skill of your choice where you're rolling a bunch of dice equal to the skill number. Whoever rolls higher gets to hire builders first. And again, this matters because every builder hired increases the cost for any future builders hired in the same round. The next potential action is hire adventurer. Now, there are three levels of adventurers, adept, heroic, legendary, and you have to own at least one adventure of the previous level to hire one. So you can hire an adept, fine, but to get a hero, you have to already have an adept, and to have a legendary, you have to already have a heroic. Each adventurer is skilled in at least two of the skills or more, and most of the adventurers feature game-breaking abilities that come into play during specific phases or on specific turns. Generally, the, the heroic and legendary ones have more powerful abilities and are more skilled in either higher numbers in single skills or spread out over multiple skills. Now, the base cost to hire an adventurer is printed on the board, and it depends what round the game is in. Gold used to hire, as I mentioned earlier, has to be placed when giving orders. And you end up spending the entire amount if you hire an adventurer. There's no change here. Now, the reason you might want to assign extra is if two or more guilds attempt to hire the same person, this just makes sense. They go with whoever pays the most. Now, if two guilds offer the same amount of money, now we get into a skill check for the tiebreaker to see who gets to hire. And you aren't much of a guild without adventurers after all, so it's kind of important to get a few of these. <laughs> Plus, every adventurer is worth points. In a way, this is almost a Steffenfeld game. Everything you do, everything you build, everyone you hire is worth points in this game. There is definitely a point salad aspect to Guildmaster. 
Next thing you can do is attempt a contract. Each contract is going to list one or more skills with a difficulty number under them. Now, some will have matching difficulties, like you can use whatever might or stamina, and you need a 15, or other ones will be like guile, you can do it with an eight, but might you need a 60. To complete a contract, you're going to make a skill check on whatever that specific skill is with the adventurers you assigned to complete it. A successful check that hits that difficulty or higher gives an instant reward of points and fame, sorry, gold and fame, money and fame. Most cards also offer a bonus. Now, the bonuses in this game almost always let you take something for yourself or take something away from the other players, often that being the player in the lead. Now, some contracts also feature a boon. These stay in play and can be discarded later to do something. Finally, the player then replaces the card with a face-down card from any of the three contract decks. And the interesting thing here is it's all common contracts. It's up to the players when the higher level contracts come out. If you fail a check, you got nothing. You wasted your turn. Now, I must admit, this is part of the game that annoyed me. It's really easy to fail a skill check, even with a large number of adventurers on a contract. Uh, whereas I would prefer to see a way to succeed without a need to roll if you reached a certain skill level. This particular aspect of the randomness in the game mm -hmm. is frustrating. Like rolling, rolling if you're competing against another player for a, a builder spot is one thing, but these uh, these missions, it was just too easy, no matter what you did, to fail a contract. Yeah, it is definitely a, a dice-based game. Um, there is ways to mitigate it. Like I said, the, the upgrades that let you skill upgrades are huge. You can reroll dice or you can set dice. Um, but to help you with this, the back of the rule book actually has a probability chart. And Sean's right. Even with 10 dice, there is still a chance you could roll all once. So it is possible to fail. There is a strong random element to this game. Now, if two or more guilds attempt the same contract to try to do it, you end up with what to me feels very much like a role-playing game. If two parties come up and they both are about to capture the unicorn together, you're going to start negotiating. Players have the option of cooperating. And if they do, they'll split the rewards. Um, they have to negotiate how. And then either each can attempt to check on their own with their own adventurers. And if either player succeeds, they succeed together. Or you can choose to combine your adventures. Like, I'm going to take my adventure and I need Sean's adventure. I'm going to put those two together and make one combined check. And again, if we succeed, we split as we previously agreed. The thing is, before you actually do this, you're going to take this little token that's got a, a stop and a thumbs up on it. And you're going to see if one of you decides to um, try to do it on their own. And you're going to reveal that in a prisoner's dilemma style system, because you may choose to just forget it. I want to do it on my own. Well, if you both decide or all three of you, it could be up to you could all four guilds could actually be attempting the same thing. If everyone decides to go in on their own, you're all going to make a skill check, but you get minus one for every die you use, which trust me, that is a significant penalty that can add up. The player with the highest difference between the skill check they needed and the, the, the what they rolled wins the contract. Now, it's also possible that you're going to agree to cooperate and then one person conflicts and the other person decides to go for it. Well, then the person who conflicted gets to try it on their own. They suffer that minus one penalty. And if they succeed too bad for the other player, you got there first. Now, if you have multiple people conflicting, if they all fail, the people who decide to cooperate then get a chance at it. It's a little bit confusing. This is probably the most confusing part of the game, but basically a prisoner's dilemma with up to four involved parties. The final action you can do that's the, that you can assign your people is to complete a private contract. Every player starts with two private contracts at the start of the game, and you're going to earn up to three more during play, depending on how long your game is. Now, instead of attempting a contract at the board, you always have the option of completing a private contract. Interestingly, you can also attempt a private contract if you end up that your order is invalidated. Whether that's another guild beat you to it or you failed the skill check to complete the thing, you still get to do something. Now, completing a private contract works the same as completing a public one. Same type of skill check. And my same annoyance with the roles applies here. <laughs> now, there is one final option that I personally think is kind of the wah wah. There's nothing else you can do. If you've got nothing better to do with the team. Or if you get shut out on an order and you have no private contracts, you can do this thing called wandering. You pick a skill check, you roll the dice, and you get 
fame and or gold, but it's like one for every 10 you roll. So it, you don't get much. This is honestly, like I said, this is kind of the, I screwed up kind of thing where it's the, 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 um, the no prize when someone else takes something from you and you're like, well, at least you get something out of it. Now, all these actions technically don't take place during the plot phase, right? Right. Your plan or not plot the order phase. These actually take place in the action phase, which happens after everyone's completed their orders. Now, the way this works is everyone does order one, then everyone does order two, then everyone does order three if there is one. And if anyone's earned the fourth order, they get to do it. Note only one person can actually have fourth orders. And all of these also happen in specific order. So when doing order one, building happens before recruiting. Recruiting adepts happens before recruiting heroes and so on. And contracts are done in order of A, B, C, D, E, F. So timing can be very important. Yeah, it becomes obvious as you play, but it's very fiddly, albeit for very good reasons. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the things I did note earlier is the rule book is very succinct. So take it very literally. If you look up a rule, take it how it says. Don't question it. Go with what it says because they know what they're doing. Now, after everyone's completed their actions, there is a reset phase. You clear your order boards. Um, you're going to collect income. That's based on what level your bar is in your guild. Um, the builder track resets. And also three times during the game, uh, in three, six, and nine turns, three, six, and nine are what's called the blood moon phase. Uh, the contracts and adventurers on the board are wiped and replaced by new ones, which is actually a really nice mechanic because sometimes stuff gets out that just no one can complete. And it's nice that there's something there to wipe it. Finally, once you've replaced any cards that need to be replaced, you flip up all the new stuff and you start a new phase, a new, a new round. Now, at the end of the reset phase in round nine, the game ends. There is a little tiny bit of end game scoring. You are going to score fame for your remaining money, one point for every five gold, and for those prestige upgrades I mentioned earlier. Player, the guild with the most fame runs the city. And I must admit, the moon phase timing mechanism is both fun and thematic. Yep. It's a nice minor thing that's just really a nice touch in the game. Yeah, I didn't really go into detail on it, but honestly, every turn the moon flips between it's it's either either in full or not. And that affects the cost of things. And some of the character abilities only go off at certain times, and which, which really leads me to my next point. This is how the game plays overall. This is a card-driven game. This is a game where you're collecting hands of cards and playing adventures and these adventurers have abilities and your contracts have boons that you can save up and spend and there's bonuses on the contracts and they all do all kinds of interesting things um most of the the contract things are actually about as i mentioned earlier about helping players who are behind in fame by giving the money for everyone that's ahead of them like a lot of the cards are get something for everyone ahead of you or penalize the people who are in front. And that you always have, tend to have that decision, help yourself or hurt someone else. So uh, now that we've got a good idea of how to play Guildmaster, what did you think of this fantasy take that card driven game? So I mentioned this most recently in my Code Monkey Going Bananas review last week, but I am a big fan of program movement games. Uh, ever since the original Avalon Hill Robo Rally, I've been uh, uh, somewhat obsessed with hidden programming, program my thing, reveal it and see what happens. That was my main draw for Guildmaster. What really made me want to check it out. Plus the theme just sounded cool. Like this sounds like running a fantasy adventurers guild. And it, they, they mechanized that and that sounded fascinating. Now, once I actually sat down to play Guildmaster, the first thing I was impressed by was the presentation and component quality. Uh, the player screens in particular are some of the best I've ever seen in a board game. Like, not only do they look cool, like they look like adventuring guilds and all four of them are unique. They are extremely functional, not only for hiding what you're planning from the other players, because they, they, they form almost a full square, but they also feature a complete rule summary on the back of them. Like these screens effectively remove the need to look up things in the book, which is fantastic. Yeah. Now, while I'm a bit down on this game, I won't in any way bash the materials or quality mm -hmm. of what you get with it. They did an excellent job of making this game attractive, playable and thematic. Yeah. Overall, the production quality is excellent. Um, the board's very well designed and easy to read. The design actually makes the flow of the actions. Like I said, it's kind of, 
So you know what happens before what? Well, it's all left to right, top to bottom, as you'd expect. Uh, there are nice little touches in, included in the game, like to indicate you're done programming. You actually have a silk banner with your, your heraldry on the end of it. You grape over the edge of your guild hall to say, I'm done programming. Just things are actually like a step above what you'd expect. Even more impressive, though, to me, than the presentation. Presentation's great. The gameplay is even better. This game could look half as good, and I would still love it because the gameplay is so solid. This is an excellent program movement game that does a fantastic job of tying that theme of running an adventurer's guild to the mechanics. The actions you take are just what you think a fantasy guild would do. You're, you're going to improve your guild hall. You're going to improve the bar. You're going to add stables. You're going to hire new heroes, and you're going to send those heroes out to complete contracts. Even the way you assign heroes on specific tasks, like oh, I am sending these two to go talk to the builders and I'm handing them 10 gold to do it. Like it just makes sense. It just makes sense as far as the theme and the mechanics. And then the steps taken for each action are even kind of logical, right? Like you need money to hire builders. And when you do hire them, there's less builders available. So the next builders charge more. When two people attempt to hire the same adventurer, of course, the person who offers the most money is who they go with. You end up pairing your adventures with similar skills to increase your chances of completing contracts or you're doing a whole teamwork thing. Even the negotiation system, when two or more guilds meet, just feels like a group of adventurers meeting up and trying to decide whether to work together or not. And there's always that chance the one team's going to be like, no, we're going it on our own. Screw you. Yeah, without chance, without question, this isn't some painted on theme with loosely connected mechanics mm -hmm. and fluffy abstractions. This is in your face fantasy adventure guild management in a town where only one guild will take home the riches. Now, the big potential issue this game has is that betrayal element. This is not a cooperative game, nor is it in any way multiplayer solitaire. This is not your traditional Euro game. In this game, you are competing with the other guilds, and that competition can get nasty. Bribery, negotiation, and backstabbing is not only an aspect of the game, it is encouraged, and I would say, except in the most peaceful group imaginable, inevitable. It's going to happen. You can literally, in this game, bribe another player with as many coins as you want for anything. Like, I want you to go to the builder before Sean, so I'll give you three guild if you program that in your one spot. Totally legit in this game. And binding. Now, the cutthroat nature means there is no way this game is going to be for everyone. This is never going to be on a list of must-have games everyone should own. Also, unlike other good games publishing games like Unfair, which we recently reviewed, there's no way to dial down these take that elements. There's no game changers here to make it a more friendly game. The take that nature of this game is a core aspect of the game. And I honestly think the game wouldn't really work if they were removed. That's what this game's about. Yeah, and along with the rolling for uh, completing contracts, this is where the game falls outside of my preferences. Mm -hmm. It's a great game, and I can't find much fault with it. I just personally don't enjoy this type of game. Which is totally fair. Now, what I did like about the take that elements is it's not in your face all the time. It's not ever present. It's going to happen. Well, we found competition for builders. That's something that tended to come up every round. Someone's going to rush to build builders. Someone's going to get there before you. The builder cost is going to go up. But the competition for hiring adventurers happened much less often. And it was easier to predict. It was easier to be like, oh, you're probably going to go for that guy. So I'm going to go for this guy. Or you happen to have that ability that lets you program it in slot two, but do it first. So I'm not even going to try this turn because I know it's a full moon. Like it was more predictable. And yes, it happened. But even then you could just throw a ton of gold at it to make sure you got the one you really needed. And then actual competition for contracts was even more rare because it's based on the number of players. In a full game, there are six contracts up. And matching up not only the contract you want to compete, but in the same slot was fairly rare. Now, while it did come up a few times every game, it's not like you spent every round, every turn negotiating with other players. It was just part of the game that would come up now and then. Though, so of course, this will be impacted somewhat by player count. Yes, very true. Speaking of player count. I do have to mention this. Um, this is something I mentioned in my earlier reviews or, or previews when we were talking about playing this for the few, few times. I definitely prefer Guildmaster at three and four players. 
Now, well, the game works perfectly fine at two players. In no way is it broken. All the mechanics work. Everything's there. You just have less spots to choose from. And yes, it can become quite the cutthroat game of cat and mouse with two experienced players. I found that almost all aspects of the game were improved with more players, especially at four. We have the most interaction at four, and this is a game about interaction. Yeah, and not at all surprising when you look at the mechanisms involved in the game. Overall, I personally really enjoyed Guildmaster. And to be honest, this is a game where I'm still having fun discovering it and trying new combos and trying different things. I've actually enjoyed this every time I play, I enjoy it more. I'm like, oh yeah, this is good. We got to play again. Let's get together next weekend and play some more Guildmaster. My wife feels the same. And my sister-in-law actually considers this to be one of her favorite games of all time. That said, I do know people who didn't enjoy this game like Sean here. Well, my usual home group embraced the take that nature of the game. Sean doesn't really enjoy games with this much skullduggery, though I still find that so strange because you were always playing the thieves in our Warhammer games and like, like your whole Warhammer archetype was to run a guild and here's your chance to do it. So again, I love the idea of the game and it's been themed so well. It was just not hitting the spot for me. Negotiations in particular are something I tend to avoid in real life and I'm going to avoid them in games as well. Fair enough. Gaming's most be fun. Don't want to stress yourself out. So totally fair. If you don't mind, take that element. If you're not like Sean and you do like negotiating, I'd suggest checking out Guildmaster. Now, if you're a fan of the fantasy theme and you want that feeling of running an adventures guild, if you've ever wanted to be the head of the Thieves Guild, you could probably pick this one up and not expect to have any regrets. Just blind, you don't even need to try it first. Guildmaster does a fantastic job of integrating that adventuring guild theme with its mechanics. Now, if you are a fan of like diplomacy style games and negotiations and love games where you work together with someone only to stab them in the back three turns later, this could be the perfect game for you, even if you're not a huge fantasy fan. Now, if you don't like games featuring backstabbing and or negotiations, this is probably not going to be for you. Now, if the theme does school, sound cool, you do you may want to try it out. You might want to give it a shot just to see, because like we're not talking about playing werewolf or coup where you're lying to someone in their face. It's more subversive than that. And this is not a game where you have to lie to your friends necessarily. You just might flip over that token to the not com cooperate side every now and then when doing a contract. Now, speaking of trying out Guildmaster, you can play this game for free on Tabletopia. Mm -hmm. We've done this. And while the interface isn't perfect, it works pretty well, better than some other games we've tried on that platform. <laughs> now, do note, however, that it's not fully scripted and no. doesn't teach you how to play the game. Yeah, the rule book is present there so you can read it, but you're going to have to figure it out yourself, unfortunately. Well, that's it for our look at Guildmaster from Good Games Publishing. We welcome you to read more about this game in the review section of our blog over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So this past weekend was the 2021 Extra Life Tabletop Appreciation Weekend. And due to that, we played a ton of games. Uh, we gained for a total of 24 hours over three days, which featured a mix of both in-person and online gaming. We said it already earlier in the show, but I think it deserves to be said again. Thanks to everyone mm -hmm. who took part in any way, watching the stream, playing games with us and donating to the cause. So this weekend started Friday night with an in-person game of Space Base with the Shy Pluto expansion, where we managed to do some things to keep things spoiler free. Uh, we are at the point now we have one chapter left to play to finish off this story based expansion. Still eager for you to finish it up so that we can use it as well. I won't get the slow rollout that you guys enjoyed. I just mm -hmm. want to see all the additions it's brought to the game. Now, next, I introduced Tori and Kat to Quacks of Quedlinburg. Uh, that was a ton of fun and I think made for a very entertaining stream. Definitely a fun one. And while we did get some complaints about the wide camera angle, I think fans of Kator appreciated it. Yeah. That, and I just, Tori is such a hoot. We just need him on every stream, everything we ever do. He should be on the podcast right now behind, between us somehow, <laughs> just making everyone laugh. 
Now, we followed that up by teaching Tori and Kat Reef, which they liked, but didn't love as much as I thought they would. They're, they're big fans of Azul and Sagrada and those type of puzzle games. I thought it would be a bigger hit. And while this one ended up being not the best game to live stream. Now, in order to get the chat room interaction up and laugh started again, we decided to next play a round of medium. It's been a while since we played this party game, and I got to say medium is still a ton of fun. Yeah, and it was a fun night. And while I couldn't be there, I was managing the stream remotely and uh, helping with the chat. So being able to speak up and interject now and then was a yeah. fun new aspect to the stream. Yeah, having having your volume on was definitely an advantage to that. We might have to do that for if we ever get back to playing Gloomhaven again. <laughs> might have to keep Sean's audio on, especially because he could point out things in the chat so we didn't have to constantly have our eyes on it. So that was awesome. So and also thank you for running things while we just sat and played games. <laughs> So I was in for the first night. Saturday started off with a couple games of Space Base again, but this time online on Board Game Arena, where we managed to get both Sean from Hamilton and Sean Hamilton to the same table, digitally at least. There was no fakery involved that was not Sean with a thicker beard. I have two things to say about this one. First, I love that mod you found. We were going to have to remember to drop a link to that. Sorry, I said BGA. Sorry, yeah, this was TTS. on Tabletop Simulator, yeah. T TTS. My bad. Thanks, uh, Courtney. Sorry, that was on that was on uh, Tabletop Simulator. The mod you found is fantastic. We're going to be sure to drop a link in it. I, I think it said something like space space with expansions. I can't quite remember what it is. It is a fantastic mod. And second, Sean Hamilton actually reached out after the fact to write me and say, man, that was good, basically. Like, wow, I really enjoyed that. And he's looking forward to playing it in person. That is such a good game. Yeah, it's great to hear he liked it. He certainly did well enough in the game. Yeah, that second game. Uh, I still keep playing it too much like Solitaire. And I have to say, that is a bad way to be playing Space Base. Yeah, like, like it almost could be multiplayer Solitaire, but you really do have to pay attention to what other people are doing. Yeah, you need Not that you can do anything with the dice, but, but you, you do to have to watch. If you get a set of die, make sure to look at what other people have before you set that die. Don't just look yeah. at your own board. I, you really, and you just really need to watch and realize, oh, I need to shift my engine, whatever it takes. Yes. Uh, you know, I've been moving in the wrong direction and someone else has already kicked it over into victory point mode. Yeah, the when to shift to doing victory points. And uh, Courtney's asking in the chat, uh, Sean Hamilton destroyed us with colonies. Like, destroyed us. He finished the game with 58 points, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> Next up were multiple plays of Takedo on Board Game Arena. Uh, started off just two players, Sean and I, and then later had Deanna join us. And then we had some members of our chat room join us for a few rounds. Um the, the cool part here is this is uh, our friend Eugene has been kind of out of touch for a little while. Um, he lives in Detroit. He's uh, we hang out like long term friends going back to high school and he hasn't played a board game since the pandemic started. Uh, he worked in a hospital in Detroit and was right on the front lines the whole time. And he had never heard of board game arena because he was literally doing hospital, go home, sleep hospital. Like that was his whole life for the last two and a half years, pretty much. Um, so he had no clue that it existed. So that was really cool. Um, so we introduced him to Board Game Arena. He actually made an account while we were on the stream and joined us for a couple games. So that was awesome to get to play with you, Jacob. Indeed. It turns out uh, I play more Takedo than I realized and have apparently improved some from it, from playing all so much. Oh, yeah, Sean. I, why, I think you beat us once and you won every other game. Yeah, and I think came we back. played six times. I played a solo, uh, a one-on-one -on -one with Huge uh, and, and beat him rather badly. And he got really upset and just crushed us the next game. I don't yeah. know what it is. I mean, maybe he went looking for upset. strategies online or something. <laughs> I don't know. After Takedo, um, D and I were hungering for something a little meaty. Like I said, we tend to like medium, heavier games. So we swapped over to a three-player game of Clans of Caledonia. Uh, which went well, despite pretty much all of us completely forgetting how to play at first and all of us making glaring, terrible mistakes early in the game, which I think by the end had it kind of balanced score wise. I, I still dig it. That is, that is a great game. What I need to do is build that box insert over there. So next time people are down, we can break out the physical copy with some nice bling. Indeed, that's a game I'm happy to play anytime and would honestly prefer it to the regular Terra Mystica game we always have playing. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I'm, if I've got to pick between two area control board games, I'm going to go with uh, Clans of Caledonia. How many does that play? 
I know it's at least four, but does it do like five or six? Like, can we get a big group game of that going? I'm not sure. I will say that after that event, we um, we do have a game going now, and we probably will have one ongoing for quite some time. After that, we went to Lighter Fair. Um, I taught Sean how to play Onitama because Deanna had some stuff she wanted to take care of with some auctions. Uh, Onitama is still one of my favorite all-time two-player games. Yeah, I'm not sure how I missed that one until now, but aside from my brain flipping mm-hmm. cards around uh, to my detriment, it's just a great game. Yeah, really. I love the way the perfect information, the, the fact that every card is in play from turn one and they never change. Next were a couple rounds of Battle Sheep. Um, this is a game my kids own that I've always liked. And it's one of those games where like, yeah, it's a kid's game, but then you play it and you're like, oh, there's a lot more here going on than I thought. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun sh- showing it off. I'm amazed Eugene managed to win, thinking he had to split his sheep evenly every turn. But then we did leave him a wide open field to do it in. Yeah, it's it's interesting. <laughs> uh, and four players for Hands of, Cal- Hands of Caledonia. That's it. Or that's it. Yeah, see, that's not quite as big a group we can get going as we can in Terra Mystica. Yeah. Uh, next, we moved on to some code names and code names duet using the amazing and awesomely free digital implementation CG has put out. This thing is amazing. You just go to codenames.game. That's it. You create a room, you share the link with your friends, and start playing code names. Yeah, it, they spun this up specifically for the pandemic, I believe, and yeah. the world is a better place for it. Now, we finished off the night with I don't know how many games of concept on Board Game Arena. I still love that game. That is my late night gaming marathon game to this day. I Like every extra life I play it, this was no difference. I still loved it. It took a bit to get some of the new players involved, but we had people from our chat room playing. We had people guessing in the chat. We You just got to play the, the leader. Danielle was playing. It was great, but what I hadn't really noticed until – this game was just how dated the cards are getting. Yeah, they really need a fresh set of cards for this. But thankfully, that's all the game requires. The actual yes. clue giving system for giving clues to players is still really solid. Now, uh, too much coffee painting pointed out and something we might need to try next time is there are all kinds of clue generators out on the Internet that next time we ditch the cards and just play it our own way. Next, we move on to day three. Uh, it started off one o'clock with our brunch with the bellhop, followed by a ton more Codenames Duet online. And we figured out how you're actually supposed to use it this time as it, well and stop playing Extreme. It wasn't Extreme. It just we were using the don't choose this card as the hey, I want this card. It definitely did get better once we figured out the proper way to click things. Indeed, it, it, it's a very smooth mechanic that just feels natural once you're you're used to doing it the right way. Yeah. Now, at some point, one of the clues I gave in a game of code names was Zolkin. And Sean's like, I never played Zolkin. I don't know what the hell this clue's for. And I'm like, what? You never played Zolkin. So as soon as we finished, I taught Sean how to play Zolkin with Sean D and I. And I got to say, the BJ implementation is really damn good though small and hard to see. But then the tool tips on that are amazing. The mouse over in that is better than any other game I played on BGA. And honestly, like I want that in my physical version so I don't have to explain everything. It was so great for teaching the game. Like just mouse over everything. It'll tell you what it does. So I don't have to try to explain everything. Um, I I actually found it a breeze to teach because of this. Because it was like, here, I'm going to show you the mechanic. Put a guy out or take guys away. They're going to keep turning around the thing and build up. And you kind of want to leave them on as long as you can. But there's strategies and there's things going between. But like to know what each slot does, just mouse over. That was awesome. Uh, We ended up playing more than one round. And again, invited people from the chat to join us. Yeah, this is a fun game, but it's horrible to stream. Yeah. As you can't see anything on the full board shot. And if you actually followed someone zoomed in, you'd probably get motion sickness just from moving yeah. from wheel to wheel to wheel. Yeah, like I, I, I got to admit, Space Space had that problem too. When we were first streaming Space Space, probably should have mentioned that. We had it zoomed out. We had people in the chat complaining they thought they were watching ants. So then I took over the stream and I literally just basically shared my camera and moved around everywhere. And actually kind of worked because I kind of did like the game show thing where it's kind of talking about why people are probably buying stuff and that. I think it was good, but I have no idea because we didn't really get any more feedback after that. <laughs> So, yeah, I I would happily start another game on Zulkin on uh, BGA, but that could just be one because I I never lose at that game. (laughs) That that is the one Euro game that just, I don't know, something in my brain clicks. I I see the patterns. 
Uh, we finished off the event going back to Codenames Duet. So, so honestly, CGE, you thank you for you know sponsoring us unofficially because we played a heck of a lot of your games online. Uh, we played more Codenames as we wrap things up uh, on Codenames.game. And a big thank you to everyone who took part. Now, while it was awesome to get so much gaming in, and I love the fact we were able to play 24 hours of games, and we got to play online with people who we couldn't get together in person to play, how was it way more exhausting than I expected? Like, I was wiped when we were done. I'm like, done. And we didn't even do 12 hours on Sunday, but, like, I actually felt it on Monday. Like, Monday should have been a holiday. I should have took Monday off. But instead, I, like, released six things because I hadn't released them all weekend. It worked my butt off. I needed a day off after that. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't go later into the night on Sunday. Overall, I think we timed it out rather well. Yeah. Uh, although at the end of the stream on Saturday, I was. Yeah, I, you were you were burned. <laughs> I, I was doing good, but Sean was yeah, definitely. I, I, that, I, that's part of why we switched to code names at the end. Is like, yeah, I know how to play this. I could I could have tapped out a little earlier on Saturday and not been upset. Yeah, like like we spent the weekend sitting on our butts mostly playing video games, like digital versions of games. I don't know why it was so tiring. Uh, so speaking of this coming weekend, which we weren't, but how about a look yeah. ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? How'd that get in there? All right. So I'm actually really pleased to say the pile of obligation honestly looks tiny. Uh, it, it's shrinking regularly. I look at it now and I'm just kind of like, that's not bad. There, there's not much left there. Um, two of the games I think I want to hammer off next is one it's not even like i'm dreading it or putting it off it just hasn't i haven't been in the mood that's hidden games crime scene the maple brook case this is a murder mystery escape room in a box style game that comes in a sealed envelope that we're going to tear open and play and i just i'm like i could be playing unfair i could be playing this i could be playing that it just hasn't been what i felt like doing but I do know that Brenda, my mother-in-law, is a huge fan of, of logic puzzles and solving things like this. So uh, assuming we are going over this weekend, I think I'm going to bring that. Uh, and that's going to be a nice one. I don't have to play five times because this will be a one and done. And then um, I talked about this one. I think it was last week or I don't know if it was last week or Sunday. But the Red Bernoos, Algeria 1857. Um, that one is a game that's not coming out until 2022 but is releasing on kickstarter fairly soon and i want to try it out now i did make a mistake when i, I in my head somewhere i swapped this thinking it was a two-player war game it's actually a deck building game so it's going to take some plays like deanna and i are going to have to sit down and play and i was thinking two of us can just hammer through a bunch of games one night well i'd also like to try it with more people so it's probably going to be a couple weeks but i'd like to at least learn the game with deanna and then maybe also bring that on sunday now, along with that, what I need to do is um, get that Clans of Caledonia insert build. And then I do have something new for the pile of obligation, Roll Camera. Um, Roll Camera may be our next giveaway, hint, hint. I'm not certain, but we do have two copies of the game. I'm going to be mean and keep the Kickstarter version, but we'll probably get rid of a, a retail edition of that game. But before we give it away, I want to review it. I want to be hyped about it. I want to tell people about it. Sean's curious about checking this game out. But I do need to unbox it. So because I'm going to set up the camera to do the, the insert build, I might do some unboxings ahead of time. But all of this depends on whether I get other stuff happens and life happens and we do have some events we have to take care of. And we have a kid going into high school in the next couple of weeks. So we'll see how that works out. If I do do unboxings, what I'm probably going to do is... Um, do some stuff off my pile of shame, not obligation. We are actually, except for roll camera, caught up on all unboxing videos for the pile of obligation. So I might start unboxing some stuff in my personal pile of shame, possibly starting with the salsa expansion for uh, Concordia, because it's one that has been on my pile of shame for far too long. And I always talk about how much I love Concordia and everyone tells me salsa makes it better. It's time to make that happen. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Matt Wickton Waller. Thanks, Matt. Roger Malosh. Awesome job raising money for Extra Life. And thanks for joining our team. Zopi, thank you. Brian Sheehan, who I'm sure would like to remind everyone that Enfilade, a historical miniature gaming convention, is coming up on Labor Day weekend. And David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Well, that was the double bell. 
That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued effort, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for this show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.